Praise God. Let's worship God together this morning. Amen. Free every cap. 
Father, you ask us to put on armor, oh God, and we are part of this, but you fight our battles. You fought the war. You won the war. Lord, we live in that victory today, oh God. And so, Lord, as we see a victory, we sing about seeing a victory, Lord. We're stating the truth about what you did on the cross and the way that you made, oh God, that we just need to walk in it, oh God. We need to walk in it and absorb, oh God, what you have done for us, oh God, to accept the grace and the mercy that you offer, offer to us, Lord Jesus. We thank you for that. We bless you, Lord. We thank you for the victory. God, we thank you that we can walk in it and share in it, Lord Jesus. And Lord, if there's any spot in our life, any way in our life, oh God, that we need victory today, I pray that we would just speak it in Jesus' name and ask in Jesus' name that you would come and you would give us victory over depression. You would give us victory over sickness and, and illness and, and financial difficulties or anything else that may be going on, oh God. You can do that for us in this moment right now, Lord Jesus. We thank you for your, for your presence, oh God. Pray that you be glorified in this place today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. As we have already worshipped in our singing at Willowdale PC, we also worship through our giving. And we want to give you an opportunity to keep giving to the cause of God. Online giving is available, and it's really easier than ever to do. Just go to our website, willowdalepc.com, and click on the Giving tab in the right-hand side. And under Push Pay, click Give Here, and you can give any amount. Just follow the simple instructions to give. It'll take you less than two minutes, and it's a very secure way to make your donation. For those who don't have access to the Internet, please share with them that they can drop off their tithes and offerings here at the church in the office mail slot by the front door. God bless you, and thank you for your faithful giving. Treehouse Kids, and I'm here today to bring you today's announcements. So let's get right into it. Treehouse Adventures is back every Wednesday from 6.30 to 7.30 right here in the building. If you know kids or if you have kids, join us here for singing, dancing, games, stories from the Bible, object lessons, and so much fun. I don't know about you, but I am so excited that fall is finally here. I'm also so excited that Treehouse Kids is back in full swing. If you would like to help out as a teacher or as a helper, and if you'd like to serve in any way in this ministry, please reach out to us. We would love to have you serve. And if you'd like more information, feel free to contact Carrie Ann. Prayer is an integral part of who we are here at Willowdale PC. So I want to invite you to join us every Friday at 10 a.m. here in the building or online on Zoom. Hope to see you there. Here at Willowdale PC, we are amazed at the amount of growth we've experienced over the last six months. And we are so excited about the growth we are continuing to experience. So, in order to facilitate our vision, starting November, we will be moving to two services. Our new service times will be 9.30 and 11.30 a.m., and we will continue to have our online service at 5 p.m. If you are interested in serving in any area here at our church, feel free to contact Christine for more information. So that's all the announcements we have for you. So let's lean in and prepare our hearts for God's Word today. everyone and welcome uh, today to our uh, online production as well and, and as we welcome people who are here uh, in the building in person and I'm stuttering because I don't want to forget this I want you to come with me for a minute we're just going to go uh, over to this section here 
and I want to show you all of the boxes that have been brought in so far. More will come in the second service today for Samaritan's Purse. And uh, we've done this for the last several years, and uh, these will be mailed out to children all across the world, and they will receive something for Christmas, uh, something uh, in their uh, little gifts, school supplies, that kind of thing, and a message about the gospel, and this is done in the love of Jesus, and uh, to make sure that children all over the world in countries that are poor, mostly, uh, can celebrate Christmas. So what we normally do is we pray over this, and so I'll just invite you to pray with me now, and we'll bless these boxes as they go out. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing and the prosperity that you give to us. Thank you, God, that we live in this country where uh, our needs are met and our economy is good, and even through the struggles of the pandemic, you've been able to sustain us. Thank you for the generosity of the people in our church who have purchased these little items in these Samaritan's Purse Christmas boxes. And we pray, God, that as they go out and are distributed, that every little child that receives a gift will also learn about the gift of Jesus Christ at Christmas time, and will know that in the spirit and in the name of Jesus, they were remembered and that you matter to them. And we pray for this in Jesus' name. And everybody says, amen. Amen. So today is the second last Sunday in our series. And uh, I thought it would go to the end of October when I planned this. It's an eight-part series but there were five Sundays in October, and so we're going to be done next week. And uh, today is a revolutionary uh, message. Maybe you've never heard what I'm going to share today before in your life, or you've not realized when you've read Scripture that these templates and patterns are there for us. But in our series today, number seven, part seven, we're, con we're in our series, Going Green, Changing the Climate in Your Home, we're going to talk about differentiating roles of men and women. Now, I've been uh, noticing on Netflix they got some new shows, and when there's not a game on, then I like to watch old shows, and I've been really into Law and & Order, the original Law & Order, not the all, all the spin-offs, and uh, I like seeing the huge, gigantic cell phones, you know, that people are using, right, from 25 years ago, and uh, so I've been watching a little bit when there's nothing, no Raptor games on or whatever, or no football, and uh, I love how every Law & Order show begins with this. Now, I can't say it like the announcer from Pennsylvania. I forget his name, but he is very famous for, for this more than anything else. He's got that deep, grovelly voice. But it says at the beginning of every Law & Order show, in the criminal justice system, the people are represented by two separate yet equal groups. The police who investigate crime and the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders. These are their stories. How many have heard that before, right? All right, what strikes me about that is I wanna to say today, uh, there's something that is separate and equal about the police and district attorneys and they work together. And if we were going to say one was more important than the other, we would be remiss because we can't uh, fight crime, investigate crime, and then do nothing about the crime. And we can't, uh, prosecute any crimes and hold people to justice unless there were first the police involved in investigating the incidents. And it made me think, you're saying, well, where are you going with this? It made me think of men and women, and I've been trying over the last three weeks to really get into our spirits and into our hearts that men and women are equal but different. They are separate, they have different roles. And so I was thinking that we could get this, uh, this announcer from Law & Order to say something like this, in creation, God is represented, born witness to, by two separate yet equal sexes, men and women. And so I want to get that into your hearts today, that we're equal, we matter, we cannot bear witness to the image of God alone, we must do it together, but we're equally important. We believe and understand that both sexes are equal, and I've said this a lot, but I want us to be able to recite it in value, in dignity, and in worth. But the creative order, Adam being uh, created first uh, and then Eve coming after, God designated different roles for Adam than he did for Eve. We see last week that God uh, demonstrated in front of Adam, or at least he came to understand from watching what God had done or hearing what God had done, 
that he saw the Father moving and speaking into chaos to bring order, moving and speaking into the empty void to bring life, into death and bringing life, and moving and speaking into darkness and bringing light in the creation story. Moving and speaking became a picture of taking initiative to change, to influence this creation that God was uh, creating and forming so that when Adam looked at what God does, he wants to move and to speak or he's seen God move and speak in these areas and that's part of what he exemplifies as a man of the image of God. So when men fulfill their spiritual role as primary initiators, spiritual initiators, then we see that um, they're initiating in relationships, they're initiating in their marriage, they're initiating in family to bring order, to bring spiritual life, to bring light and truth to darkness. And they bear witness to their families, to their spouse, to uh, people that they influence. They bear witness to that part of God's nature. But God's nature is not just that. And so Eve also has to play a part. And together, when the two become one in marriage with God, then the trinity of God is better represented. When men, though, fail to move and to speak, we learned this last week, when men fail to move and to speak into situations, sometimes women feel the pressure to fulfill that place that men are abdicating, and that often repre uh, leaves women uh, frustrated. It often leaves them out of role and feeling like, you know, um, kind of unhappy with their position. And, and what they're forced to do because men traditionally and because of the fall have really not taken up spiritual leadership like God had intended. Or sometimes women will take on part of that primary initiating spiritual role in the home and then if they're, if they're the first ones that come to Christ, their husbands later come to Jesus or, and they're not quite as mature. And so sometimes women have been used so long to being initiating spiritually that now it's hard to let go of. And so then, uh, you know, sometimes men falter even when given the opportunity. And so what we're trying to do in this series is call men out to be the movers and the speakers and the primary initiators spiritually in their homes and in their marriages. And we want to find out what role, differentiating from that, separate yet equal, that women are called to do. So let's just stop and pray and ask the Lord to help us today as we get into this topic. God, we thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the patterns. Thank you for the metaphors. Thank you for the symbolism that we see. I pray, God, that the Holy Spirit would lead us into all truth. There's nothing that's written in your word that is a mistake or in error, but, God, that you intend for us to have a revelation of who you are. And I pray, God, that as we together, as men and women, bear your image with knowledge and in truth, that we will take on the roles that you've called us to and so reflect your image to this broken world. In Jesus' name, everybody says, amen. amen. So let's talk about differentiating roles. Adam's the example for men. Eve is the example to women. Before the fall, <clears throat> when both failed, uh, they both failed in the fall to substantiate their roles or to continue in their roles, and that became problematic. And we talk about the fall in the Garden of Eden, the fall was when both men and women and mankind, humankind, entered into sin. Adam was asked by God to work and to manage Eden. He was asked to move and to speak and to lead with his first-hand knowledge. He was even asked uh, to do things, or he took the initiative to name all of the animals, we're told in Scripture. Genesis chapter 2, verses 15 to 18, says this, The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. Verse 16, And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. The Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. God gives the instruction about that famous tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, in verses 15 through 18. And then he creates Eve, or at least the narrative of 
him creating Eve, comes to us first in chapter 2, verses 20 to 24. God takes a part of the midsection of Adam, Adam's rib, and forms Eve creatively out of Adam. But when God spoke to Adam, Eve was not yet created. This fact is not lost on us because in chapter 3 of Genesis, where the great conflict comes with the, ser- with the serpent or Satan as the serpent with Eve, we know that Eve knew about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it shows us that Adam at least began well in his primary initiating role, doing the right thing, sharing with Eve what God had told them, initiating spiritual leadership and saying, you know, we can eat off of all of these trees, Eve, but just not that one. In the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Adam had moved toward Eve and spoken into Eve's chaos and void and darkness and brought order and life and light, the good news and the light of the truth that God the Father had shared with him. Then Satan enters into the picture Genesis 3.23 says this, Uh, sorry, not 23, Genesis 3, 2 and 3. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. And then she adds something that we don't hear that God said to Adam. And this is a clue as to where she got her information from. Because then she adds, and you must not touch it or you will die. Nowhere did God say that to Adam, at least in chapter 2, before Eve was created. That second part about touching the tree. Satan's opening line in verse 1, before she answers that way, was, Did God really say? Ah, This marks out for us the pattern that the enemy likes to take with God's children. Did God really say? Everything that we do as followers of Jesus uh, centers around God's word. We're in our connect groups. We're having coffee with other Christians. People are in our homes. We share life together. We come to church and we hear and we reinforce what God says. We talk about what God says. God tells people in the Old Testament The fathers, he says, as you walk with your kids, as you sit down to supper, share with them my laws and my precepts. Teach them in the way. Do life together, and while you do life together, talk about my statutes and my laws and my decrees and and who I am. And so much of our knowledge gets caught by just being a family together. Right, And we take on the characteristics of our Father because we are talking about it, we're hanging around with Him, we're praying together. Even the act of praying together is communal. It's a community thing that we do serving Jesus. That's what's been so hard over these last 20 months about not being able to physically gather as we once did in the same way. And even when we do, you know, we have all kinds of protocols and we're, we can only come so close to each other. And you know, this is a consequence of a disease Disease, and let me just say, that did not come from God. That all disease comes as a product of sin in the world, and we're dealing with the consequences of this disease that is in this fallen world, and it starts right back here, but the enemy says to Eve, in the form of a serpent, he approaches her, talking serpent, and says, did God really say and when you are all alone and you're separated from the rest of the community of Christ and you're separated from the herd and that roaring lion is trying to single you out and take you down he's going to approach you with did God really say and that's exactly what he does in John in uh, Luke chapter 4 when he tempts Jesus and he even tries to quote scripture to Jesus it's interesting that the enemy knows what God has written Right? He really knows about Genesis 3.15, which promises his own demise. And he has been working since the fall in the garden and the pronouncement of his doom in Genesis 3.15, where God said that the seed of the woman will bruise his head and that you'll only bruise the heel of her offspring, meaning Jesus, because he's going to rise from the dead. He won't have a mortal wound. He's been working since that day until this to unseat and undermine everything that God has said in his word. 
because what God says and what God promises is true and that's what makes him God. And if it's not true and we cannot trust him and we fail to believe in his word and take God at his word, we would find him untrustworthy and fall away. This is the goal. And this is the goal because he hates God. He hates everything that God stands for and he's working in this area in this way. So we know, likely from Adam, for God spoke to Adam before Eve was created, And there's no biblical record that God spoke directly to Eve. So we can presume that Adam relayed this spiritual truth about the tree in the middle of the garden that was not to be eaten of. And that what God had commanded him, he moved and spoke into his starting family and into his marriage relationship. And this was a role that Adam was supposed to take to show how God speaks Faith is born, he keeps his word, and the blessing of God comes. And that is supposed to be channeled through men in our relationships. Now, I am surmising, and I'm not going to make a theology out of this, but I'm just going to put it out to you. I'm surmising that Eve got most of her information from Adam. There's no record of God saying it to her, and so I'm not saying he didn't. I'm just saying that it seems this way because Eve kind of gets it right, but then kind of gets it wrong. She says, we're not supposed to eat of that tree or touch it. She adds to it. You know, this book, as it ends, says anybody who adds anything to this word of prophecy and revelation or takes away from it, then they're to be cursed. Paul writes and he says, if anybody adds to the gospel or takes away from it, then they're to be cursed. It's very important, and I solemnly come into this place every week to speak to you, saying, God, let me not distort what your word says. Let me not add things that aren't there. And if I have an opinion, I want to differentiate what's an opinion from what God has really said. And so I'm just saying to you, we can presume, at least me, I'm presuming that Eve got her information from Adam because like that old game when you have 25 people in a circle called Telephone, Remember that game? And you, you say something complicated, a, a little rhyme or a little verse, and then it gets whispered all the way around the room, and by the end of it, it's totally unrecognizable as anything that's ever been said at the beginning. And so it seems to me that she kind of got most of it, but then added that piece about, and God said we shouldn't even touch it. Sometimes God tells us things, and it's reasonable, but when we retell it, there comes this unreasonableness to it. And it's kind of like a little clue to me that Eve was looking for a way for what God said not to be true. She wanted to respond. She wanted to believe what the serpent was saying. And we're going to get into that and, and get into why she might have felt that way as we look further into this. Genesis chapter 2.18 tells us that God created Eve to be with Adam, to be one with Adam, verses 23 and 24, to fulfill their role, their purpose together, to help Adam with his purpose, which was to bear the image of God, but it was only good, not very good. Alone, Adam was not set up to succeed in his task that God had formed in his own heart in Genesis 1, 26. Let us make mankind in our image. God saw two that Adam was unable to manage all that God had appointed to him effectively and without help. Thus, he created an equal and separate partner with a defined role and named her Eve. While Adam was to initiate, to move and to speak and to influence and to lead and to represent all of those things that he was to move and speak into, Eve was to help Adam by responding to those initiatives with encouragement with support with cooperation and with facilitation genesis chapter 1 verses 27 and 28 globally tells us this so god wanted mankind humankind in his own image he created so god created mankind in his own image in the image of god he created them or him but it means them in hebrew male and female he created them god blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule, and he's speaking to them, rule together over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Look carefully. Both man and woman were to rule over God's creation on earth together. 
That was God's plan in verses 27 and 28 of chapter 1. In community, in unity, in partnership with each other and with God, in harmony, to bear the image of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit working together, ruling together, taking authority together, each fulfilling their roles. And if they did that, it meant that they could subdue things together. They could have control of things together. They could multiply. They could be blessed. They could fill the earth together with image bearers, which was what God wanted. Neither man nor woman can fulfill God's mandate only fulfilling their particular role. But when we take the role separate yet equal of men and separate yet equal with women and we join that with the power of the Holy Spirit, suddenly we get a picture of the completeness of God or a more complete picture. I don't know that we'll ever know everything about God until we're with him and then I think he's so infinite we'll never come to the end of everything that there is to know about God because he's so great and he's so vast. Now I know that some of you are thinking, well, You know, God said all of this in chapter 1, and then he doesn't create Eve, or we don't hear about God creating Eve until chapter 2. So how could God be speaking to both of them in chapter 1, and yet he's not created Eve yet until uh, verses uh, uh, 20 to 24 in chapter 2? Now maybe you weren't thinking about that, but when I was studying this, I'm certainly thinking about that. So let me address it, just in case you go home and say, you know, Blake didn't highlight that real discrepancy there in scripture. In ancient Near East culture, the way to tell a story went like this. You tell the global view of the story, and then you follow it up getting into the details of what made the global view of the story true. And so in that custom, it's written all that God did in creating the earth, and then chapter two gets into the specifics and the order and the way in which God accomplished chapter one. And so the purpose in God's heart was there. And God wanted both men and women to rule together in his spirit, in union, two flesh becoming one with God to better demonstrate what he is like. As Adam was created to bear part of the nature of God as primary initiator, Eve was created to bear that part of God's nature that is the primary responder. And before you think that this is a lesser role, I want you to think it's not lesser in value, dignity, or worth. I want you to think about the fact that the role of primary responder is also representing one half of what God is like, at least. At least half of what men and women can do together with God. For God both leads us and he responds to us. God instructs us and he helps us. God initiates, and then he empowers us. He does both. Everything in God's creative strategy speaks to what is true. These intrinsic spiritual roles are mapped and reinforced, even in our physiology as men and women, as males and as females. Romans 1 says that you can't even look at nature and not see the imprint of God, the image of God. I want you to think about the fact that life generates. We've dismissed all the children, so I'm going to get a little bit into the birds and the bees here. Are you guys comfortable? Not now. Okay. If you don't know about the birds and the bees and you're coming here as an adult, well then, you know, I'm really happy to share some things with you. Here we go. Life in males begins in the body of a male as sperm. Now, it's only, it's only half the chromosomes, and then it, it, it moves, right? And it, when two become one, it moves into the woman's body and unity with the egg is, is created. Two become one and life begins and is nurtured until, in gestation and then a baby's born 40 weeks later or so. Oh, Blake, thanks for sharing. I didn't really realize that. I'm glad I came to church this morning. I want you to get not the sexual part or the the physiological part. I just want you to see it is the role of life from God's perspective to begin in the man and move to the woman. And in the woman's body, the egg receives the initiated life 
And then God meets the sperm and the egg and life is formed and then developed and nurtured. And then the baby is brought to the two of them to raise and to love for the rest of their lives and to impart. Amen? I'm just saying that God patterns everything spiritually in the physical world. Do you know what the etymology of the word male is? Does anybody know? It comes from, the, the word we use for male comes from a Latin root, which means pointed one. Think about that for a minute. Initiating. The symbol for that the international symbol and historical symbol for the male has been the circle with the arrow. Life began in Adam, even for Eve, with the rib that God took. And God has reinforced what is happening spiritually, even in our physiology. You say, well, Blake, is that, a, is that true? Is that a doctrine? Is that a, a whole you know, thing I have to believe to go to heaven? No, I'm just putting that out there so that you can see symbolically and metaphorically how God is so consistent. He's not inconsistent with what he's brought into being. He reinforces it in every strata of creation to reveal who he is. God asked Eve, patterned for women in her example, to be open, to invite in, to receive, to help ideas and initiatives from God through Adam, to cooperate, to give life to them, to help with Adam's role and dreams spiritually, to help subdue and multiply and fill the earth, equal but separate functions. Just like physically, the man cannot give birth to a child, that's the role physically of a, whim, of a woman, right? Even caring for that baby comes a little more unnatural to men. Not in every case, but certainly in this one. <laughs> right? And there's this quality, this mother quality in women that we find that men have to work hard to emulate and to see but comes so naturally to wom- women. How to hold a baby. Guys, you have to have a, a seven-point instruction. Okay, when the baby comes, okay, you hold the head like this, and, you, you, and now when you rock, okay, this is what you do. No, 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 don't hold, it. Don't, don't hold them like that. Support their head. Right? That's guys. That's me. Right? Women just take to that. Even women it alone are the only ones who can feed and sustain, get this, They're babies from their own body. Men can't do that. There are things in image bearing of God that we can only learn from the responsive, primarily the responsive nature of women to those needs. It tells us what God is like. We see the Father's heart. We see his tenderness. We see his compassion. We see the peace and the sweetness and the calmness of the Holy Spirit. These are the things that we see in women that educate us as to the other side of God's nature. It's just not law and order, but it's compassion and grace and mercy and response. We see this picture all through Scripture We love God, why? Because he initiated the Father and first loved us. Jesus initiates the plan of salvation. The Father sends the Son and Jesus goes to the cross and then we respond to his spiritual overtures and conviction. The Holy Spirit convicts us us of sin and of righteousness and of justice in Christ and then we respond to God. It's very important. God asks us to pray, and then he responds to our faith and does miracles like we sang about in the worship service this morning. Amen? Do you see this? You see this? Wave at me or something. I can't hear amens behind your mask. Okay. The world cannot see the totality of God, the wholeness of his nature, when men and women cast aside their roles that God created for them to fulfill. And we see sin enter into the Garden of Eden 
and we see, and we see when sin enters the beginning of the breakdown of God's perfect plan for those roles. And in Jesus' redemption, we see the restoration back to what we were intended to reflect about God as men and women in the power of Christ. Let me talk for a few min minutes today about attacking the roles. What God establishes, the enemy seeks to undermine. The undermining of the male, female roles and sexes leaves us acutely aware today with dissatisfaction and confusion and dysphoria devaluing and purposelessness as men and women. There's lots that is written today about people being confused about how to be, what it means to be a man in this day and age, what it means to be a woman in this day and age. I want you to notice that the serpent in Genesis 3 chooses not to approach Adam, the primary initiator, with his dubious thought, his doubtful thought. I believe that this is a demonstration of the contempt that the enemy has for God and the creative order and the creation, which is us, that God created. He's hateful of us and he's hateful of God. He approaches, not Adam, but he approaches Eve. He virtually or spiritually ignores or disrespects Adam as the spiritual leader of the home, who Genesis 3, 6 tells us was standing right beside Eve when the serpent began to speak. Satan speaks instead to the one that he knew was created to be the primary responder. Now, when I say primary, it doesn't mean that women can never initiate anything or lead anything. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means that in the family, spiritually, most of the time, primarily, God is calling men to move and speak in the ways that he is, and he's calling women to get in concert with that, in unity with what God moves and speaks in their home and confirm it, receive it, and implement it. But she responds because she's made to be a responder. And she responds, but is deceived in her response. She responds to the wrong initiator. God would come down in the cool of the day and visit with them, but now this serpent shows up, and who wouldn't talk to a talking snake? I mean, that's something new. Curiosity aroused. She responds in her deception to the wrong initiator. Satan had presumed upon Adam's role of spiritual leader, the ear of God to his wife. To, to move and to speak, Satan is usurping that, is stealing that away in this moment. Satan attacks and he throws chaos into the creative order. And the creative order means the roles that Adam was given because he was created first compared to Eve who was created second, not because the creative order of importance. I've, I've done really a lot of work to try to make you understand that men and women are equal in this series, so please don't leave here thinking anything else. Has everybody got that? Okay, good. Don't want to be misquoted. Satan works to do the opposite of God's will and desire, and by the way, the opposite of God's will and desire is the very definition of sin. And sin, through pride, originates with Satan, who thought himself God and like God and wanted to be greater than God, and so works against God to establish his own will. And that is the definition of sin. Satan seduces Eve into switching roles with Adam. Then he, because she then takes the fruit that she took off the tree and hands it to her husband. Hey, I took some of this fruit and I ate it. You have some. She starts initiating against what God has said because there's a new voice moving and speaking into her heart. It's not God and it's not Adam. It's the snake. And how does Satan do all of this? This undermining? He makes God's words, God's ways seem not good. 
He paints a picture that God is somehow holding out on you, Eve. He's holding out on you. There's more blessing. There's more goodness. Forget the happy contentedness that God wants to establish in your life. No, 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 no. God knows that when you eat of this tree, you will be like him and you'll know good from evil. And God does not want you to be like him. Now, the truth of the matter is that God wants you to reflect him. He wants you to be like him. He doesn't want you to be like the devil. And the devil was the one who wanted to go his own way and got cast out of heaven, creating sin, inventing sin, rebellion against God in the heavenlies. You see, so because God didn't want Satan because of his sin and his rebellion, he twists that around and says, God is holding out what could be better for you. God's word is not good. God's promises are not good. He tries to make out that God is sinister and calculating keeping Adam and Eve from the better life that they could have if they just did what the snake says. Eve did not surrender to God. She did not surrender to Adam's initial influence. And Adam chose not to initiate. He becomes a responder to Eve. Refusing to move and to speak when he sees her chaos right in front of him because he was standing right there when the snake was talking. He doesn't move and he doesn't speak into her chaos and her confusion. He doesn't move and he doesn't speak into the spiritual void and saying, no, 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 wait, you weren't here yet, Eve. But when God first made me, he said and reinforced what God said to Eve. He doesn't do that. He doesn't lead. He doesn't influence. He doesn't go into her darkness and say, no, here's the light of truth, Eve. Don't listen to the snake. No, no, no. Eve just says, or Adam just says, all right, Eve. I'm liking how uh, intimacy is with you, and you're so pretty, and you're naked all the time. I don't want to mess with that. If you're telling me to get, uh, get, have some of that fruit, man, sure, I love you. And what Adam does is he trades his worship of God for the worship of his wife. He takes what he's supposed to believe and obey from God and he discards it and he responds instead of initiates and he takes the fruit. Adam and Eve could have brought order and life and light. Sorry, Adam could have brought order and life and light to Eve's confusion, but he fails. That's his sin. Adam is silent. He's spiritually passive. And Eve turns to the influence and the temptation of another initiator. Oh, man, please gather this. Gather this in your heart today. When you in your family want to let your wife lead spiritually without you being the initiator of truth and light and order in God's word, when you won't get alone with God in the Mount of Olives moment with, like Jesus demonstrated and hear the voice of God for your family, you put at risk those in your family that will listen to another initiator. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. If you step into the moment, unlike Adam, and you move and you speak because you've been with God and you've listened to his heart and you've got truth welling up in you and you've got a powerful prayer life with God and a word life with God and you know the truth and you speak that and move that way into your family, it will change the influence in your household and create a new climate. And people will remember your words because God will cloak them and cover them with the anointing of the Spirit of God because they'll be reiterating what God has said as the spiritual initiator in your home. If you don't want your kids listening to outside voices, if you don't want your kids listening to the culture, if you don't want your children being open to every wind of doctrine, speak, move. When something's funky, move into it. When something's not quite right, move into it. And you and your wife, you work together, you have a plan, and you say, this is how our house is going to be. And when tragedy strikes or when something unexpected happens, we're going to join together. We're going to rule over this. We're going to subdue it together in spiritual prayer life, in, in warfare. We're going to pray. We're going to gather the family together and say, we don't understand what's happening here, but we know that God is good, and we're not going to listen to another initiator. We're not going to listen to what the devil might say about our situation. We're not going to disbelieve suddenly all the promises of God. No, no, no. We're going to take God at his word and we're going to pray together, family, and we're going to get through this and we're going to rule together. 
over the kingdom of darkness in this house. You see how that works? And one shall put a thousand to flight and two shall put 10,000 to flight. When we're united, God's plan is that you always get somebody to agree with you together in prayer when you're married. You say, well, Blake, you're talking about marriage today. I'm not married. Yes, but you see, this still shows you, when you look at other people's marriages, it still shows you what God is like. And even if you're not married, you are part of the bride of Christ, and it still, it still moves on your heart as to how God operates. So this is not just about marriages. This is about a spiritual life formation in our lives because we see how God is reflected. Adam and Eve both sinned in the garden. But they sinned differently. Eve sinned by responding to the wrong initiator. Serpent over Adam. Satan's word over God's. Her consequence was that she was deceived into coveting and to taking on a new role that wasn't hers. Initiating to Adam against what God had said. Women today live with the consequences of Eve's decision in an unredeemed world. Genesis 3.16, the curse of the garden and the curse on Eve was pain and childbearing. But not just that. Part of the curse of the Garden of Eden was the oppression of men on women outside of God's redemptive plan. Part of the curse for Eve in her disobedience and her deception and her casting out of her own role to choose Adam's part of the consequence for women is that she would be subjugated by men. That she would serve her husband in a chaotic sinful world instead of ruling and subduing equally in a partnership. She becomes subservient to her husband. Your desire will be for your husband. He will rule over you. Now that's not God's plan. That's God's curse for the consequence of not following God's plan. So don't you leave here today saying, yeah, Blake shared that you know men should rule over women. Uh Uh-uh. In God's plan, they were to be equal but separate partners. (laughs) bearing image to the nature of God but we've fallen from that and so all over the world women suffer this there's countries today we can think of even in Afghanistan we can think of cruel regimes who suffers the most women children men being physically stronger have have put women down and intimidated them I want you to know that Jesus Christ elevates the role of women in the kingdom of God. And that, like Paul writes in Galatians, there's neither male nor female. There's no hierarchy. There's just a difference of role. You see, we're equal but separate. We've got different functions, but we matter. And Jesus, even in his resurrection, elevated, even in the book of Luke, talked to women, elevated the position of women because, you see, God has not pounded women down. Men have pounded women down. And sin has pounded women down. And God wants to lift up women into the role that he always saw for them to work with men on an equal basis and accomplish God's will and plan and purpose for their lives. Do you believe that? Adam sinned too. Sin of passivity, spiritually. Standing by while the woman he was supposed to love was crashing and burning. Did not spiritually initiate. God consequenced Adam in Genesis 3, 17. Because you listened to your wife instead of me. Because you let your wife become your initiator and you a responder. Here are the consequences. Cursed ground, painful toil, unfruitfulness, work without harvest, brow, sweat, and ultimately a hard life and death. Compare first 
the first Adam's response to temptation with the response of the last Adam, which is Jesus. When tempted in Luke 4, Jesus moved into the chaos of Satan's temptation and undermining, and he spoke scriptural words, God's words. He quoted from the Old Testament. He spoke God's word to Satan when he was being tempted, and he crushed Satan because Jesus was saying, no, 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 no. The primary initiator in my life is God the Father. And he spoke that truth. And that's how he escaped the temptation. When Adam refused to operate in his spiritual role, he brought all of humankind into perpetual spiritual chaos. And that's where we are today. Perpetual spiritual confusion and futility. That's where we are today. That's the curse of sin. And Jesus came to get rid of the curse of sin. No blessing. The consequences of being out of role is that there's no blessing. There's no happy contentedness. There's discontented lives, there's anger, there's strife, there's confusion, there's frustration, there's dysphoria. Men constantly in our day and age fight not to be spiritual responders when they were created to be initiators. And women fight the temptation to take over spiritual responsibilities because men are so lax that they take over instead of letting God work on those men's hearts sometimes. And then they're all unhappy. Wives then tend to become a mother figure to their immature husbands. This is a problem in marriage. When you're a mother figure instead of an equal partner to your husband because he's immature and you're always telling him what to do because he's disappointing you because he doesn't lead and he doesn't initiate, it just makes the problem worse. And he shrinks back into that role. Responder. This results in fights and conflicts, contests and battles in the home. Because it's the curse of living out of role. Men and women can come to Christ and can say, Lord Jesus, you lead us. You initiate in our lives. And help us to work together in unity cooperation, facilitating your plan. Why do you think the enemy started from the beginning trying to wreck that first marriage? Why do you think he still tries to distort what marriage is? Redefine it in our culture and society. Say something different about it. Undermine what God has promised because he knows if he can distort what men and women were created to do and be he can distort what God is like. And that's what he wants to do. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment today? Maybe you're here today and you say, I am not a spiritual initiator at all. I have left that to other people. I'm a man and I feel that God is convicting me and calling me to initiate, to move and to speak where I have been silent and passive. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I just want to pray for you. Does anybody feel that way this morning? Just slip up a hand. I'll quickly pray for you all across this place. I have not led like I'm supposed to, and I feel convicted. I want God to help me with this, to fulfill my role. Maybe you're at home and you're thinking about this as well. Okay? Or maybe you're here today and you say, I'm a woman, Blake, and I, I haven't known how to best work with my partner and there's been a lot of strife and there's been a lot of envying and battles in our house. But I know from what you're saying today that God can help me and I can work with my husband in unity. I can see your plan in our lives and I'd like you to pray for me. Is there anybody like that here today? Just across this place. Okay. All right. Father God, I pray today for men and I pray for women. I thank you for your word. I pray that they are equal but separate in their function, in their role, and in their value. I pray, God, that you would redeem our marriages from the curse of breaking God's law right from the beginning. I pray that you would help us better transmit and project as we fulfill our spiritual roles, what you are like. And I pray this in Jesus' mighty name for the people gathered here today and those to whose hearts you're really speaking to. 
In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. I'm going to invite Earl here, and he's going to just share a couple of announcements, and then we'll dismiss, and he'll give the benediction. God bless you. Have a great Sunday. Have a great week. Bring somebody next week with you. God bless you. Pastor Earl, come. Thank you all for coming this morning. It was great having you in church. As you go today, those of you who have had a chance to give, the lobby, in the lobby we have our debit machine working. So you can give on your way out. And as you come next week, we trust that you'll invite somebody to join us for worship. Let us pray. Could you please stand? Father, indeed, we are grateful this morning for who you are, for how you created us. We thank you that you had a plan and a purpose for each of us in your divine plan. We thank you, God, that you've called us to fulfill the roles that you've designed for us. And our prayer today is that as your children, we would not listen to the voice of the enemy, but we would listen to you. As your children, we would not be motivated by culture, but we would be motivated by your words. So bless us this morning, we pray, God, and help us as we go. We pray for those who are sick amongst us. We pray, God, that you would send healing through your words. Father, we pray for those who have different issues in their lives, whether it be financial or job-wise. Our prayer today, God, is that you, the God of all source, would come to your people in the ways that you want to do it for us. That we say this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. And as you go this morning, my special prayer for you is that Christ will dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to understand with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you will be filled with all the fullness of God from this day and forever. Amen. God bless you. Have a good week.